there had been an idea floating around that depression was a manifestation of a pure deficit in serotonin. Lower serotonin, you get depressed. Take a Prozac, you get undepressed. We knew that idea was wrong right from the start because you take a tablet of Prozac, you do not get undepressed from a single tablet of Prozac. It can happen. It's extraordinarily rare, doesn't, and it usually doesn't last when that occurs. But the world is really complicated, and I'll, maybe we'll come back to it. And what's complicated is that serotonin does have a lot of acute effects in the brain, and a single dose of Prozac does change some things. So, for example, Catherine Harmer at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom has done a large number of studies to show that some of the negative biases that people have when they're depressed go away, at least transiently, with a single dose of Prozac. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there aren't some acute effects and that those effects aren't related to, to depression. It's just that this simple-minded idea that Low depression, low serotonin equals depression. Normal serotonin equals a healthy life. That idea is, we knew pretty much from the start, couldn't possibly be true as it was initially suggested. The other thing I'll say just before moving on, because there's a tendency to want to make the world simple. Either it's all serotonin or it's no serotonin. But as I said, would the most complex structure in the universe really work in such a simple-minded way that it had to be everything or nothing? Probably not. And there are brain scan studies in depression involving positron emission tomography, the work of people like Ramin Parsi and, and others, that do find some changes in the regulation of certain serotonin receptors that may be intrinsic to the biology of, of depression. So I'm not in any way arguing for a really simple-minded uh, idea of depression, but I do want to highlight that these, these monoamine depletion studies were a conceptual crisis, like the philosopher Thomas Kuhn would say. You come to a point where you have a body of theory and then you have a single experiment, which in a fundamental way challenges the idea that this idea that depression is simply a disorder of the very primitive and very few number of serotonin cells that live in a very primitive part of the brain, the midbrain and a little bit of the brainstem, that these primitive cells could be the cause of this pervasive syndrome of cognitive, behavioral, um, et cetera, et cetera, impairment, probably was, you know, just that idea itself was probably flawed from the start. But like all conceptual crises, it was incredibly stimulating in terms of creative thought about what the alternative ideas about depression were. And, and so in those days when these experiments were going on, Dennis Charney, who was the, my, now my boss, <laughs> as well as my collaborator, his office was upstairs on the ninth floor. He had a really good view of Long Island Sound. And I had a little office on the eighth floor. And, you know, I would go up at the end of the day and we would talk about science and all the things that are going on. And we wrestled with this. This is one of the things that we wrestled with a lot. If it wasn't serotonin, simply, what could it be, right? And the answer was that we came to was, let's turn the brain on, on its head. Gosh, that's a really weird <laughs> turn of phrase, but <laughs> let's turn this problem upside down. If depression isn't a disorder of these really simple and few serotonin cells in the brain, then maybe it's an, a disorder that has a major part of its biology in the parts of the brain that are responsible for regulating emotion, for processing reward, for making plans, for interpreting the world, 
In other words, the higher cognitive centers like the cortex, cerebral cortex, and the higher emotional centers in the limbic system. And there was a profound consequence of that small conceptual shift because the cortex and the limbic system are predominantly driven by different chemical messengers than serotonin and norepinephrine. Serotonin and norepinephrine tune and, and modulate the activities of the higher brain centers, but it pulled us to think about the intrinsic circuit mechanisms of the cortex and limbic system and to try to approach those circuits directly with pharmacology. These higher brain centers predominantly use two neurotransmitters, glutamate, which accounts for something like 90% of the synapses of the brain, right? The main information highway of the brain, 90% of the synapses, the main excitatory driver for brain activity. And GABA, which is the main inhibitory transmitter of the cortex. The function of the cerebral cortex and limbic system is essentially a dynamic tension, like yin and yang, between factors driving excitation and the magnitude of excitation and the timing of excitation and the spatial dispersion of activity in the brain and GABA balancing and inhibition. And we thought, well, gee, how can we tap into signaling through the main information highway of the brain? And it's really remarkable, isn't it? Serotonin is maybe a couple of percentages of the synapses in the brain. Glutamate is 90%. Psychiatry had been studying depression for 50 years by that point. Put all of its chips on serotonin and norepinephrine, the 2%, <laughs> and completely ignoring the 98% of the other mechanisms in the brain. So we thought, well, let's try that. So by that time, I had been studying for at least five years. I had been studying ketamine to try to understand its role in synaptic signaling in disorders, problems, cognitive processes, behavior, other things related to schizophrenia. And we thought, well, we can use ketamine to probe the integrity of glutamate synaptic signaling. That's been what I've been working on for the last five years. Let's bring that into testing depression. 